Welcome to the Startup Club podcast, where we share the journeys of innovation, resilience, failure, and triumph of some of South Africa's most exciting tech startup founders and investors. I'm Matthew Marsden, founder of Startup Club, and on the show today, Calvin Collett, founder and CEO of Melon Mobile, Africa's first truly digital telco, offering South Africans a fully customizable mobile network experience. Founded in 2022, Melon leverages digital eSIM technology to create a slick, do-it-yourself mobile offering, coupled with unprecedented pricing that's made it a hit with consumers and SMEs in a short time. As an app-first proposition, they're also incorporating proprietary AI to better understand and serve their customers through the user journey. Now with more than two decades of telco experience behind him, a world-class team, and armed with a truly disruptive proposition, the Melon Mobile rocket ship is poised to lead the next generation of telecoms disruption. Now before we get into today's discussion, Startup Club is built on impactful partnerships, and today's episode is brought to you in collaboration with Ingenie. Founded in 2017, Ingenie is Africa's only edtech specialized accelerator. Established on the belief that innovation and technology can help solve the continent's most pressing education challenges. Ingenie supports EdTech founders through a bespoke acceleration program in partnership with MasterCard Foundation, and they're a leader in education research and advisory support thanks to the work of their think tank, alongside leading the country's annual EdTech Week. We sat down with Ingenie's marketing and comms associate, Zoe Mayring, to learn more about their mission. And you can hear that conversation at the halfway mark of today's episode or visit ingenie.africa to learn more. For now, though, let's get back to the episode. When I left MTN, I had this super, super clear vision of what it needed to look like. What are the elements that needed to be be injected? Um, what are the non-negotiables? Uh, customer journey, brand. Yeah, I was very clear. Yes. Um, and I think that for me is like, if you're going to like book, so for me, clear vision is number one. You have to have that. Number two is team. So can you build a team that can buy into that vision because it's going to be hard. So if the team don't buy into the vision, you're going to have churn and you Absolutely. just can't afford that in the early stages. Mm. So super clear vision in terms of that, knew what kind of team I wanted. And then it was down to, you know, how do we actually do this? How do yeah. we build a digital talk? So I've got to be honest, I was a little bit naive on that one, yes. thinking that uh, <laughs> sure. I could go, uh, you know, onto the shelves of uh, Incredible Connection or whatever and, you know, pick up some software and off we go. Of course. The reality was completely nothing like that. Now, many of the ventures that we profile on the Startup Club podcast, especially those targeting consumers directly, rely on some important assumptions that users have access to both smartphones and mobile data or the internet. Now, the first factor is making swift progress, where according to GSMA, smartphone adoption in sub-Saharan Africa will increase to 87% by 2030. Then comes the next issue, can people actually access the internet? Now, in markets like Europe and the US, mobile data prices and telco offerings are remarkably inexpensive compared to Africa where a lack of historic infrastructure and market monopolies have led to a higher than average data cost, and South Africa even ranking behind the likes of Nigeria, Kenya, and Botswana. Our local market has been dominated by four or five telcos, largely controlling physical infrastructure and then determining the ways in which consumers access networks, data, and connectivity. And this presents a real challenge to startups wanting to disrupt the status quo. Now, in response, the last two decades have seen the rise of MVNOs, or mobile virtual network operators, that piggyback off incumbent networks to launch a new offering. Yet early movers like Virgin Mobile just couldn't quite make it work. Today's guest, Calvin Collett, has spent more than two decades in telco, giving him first-hand experience of the inefficiencies and opportunities in the space. And these insights have lent him to launch Melon Mobile, the country's first truly digital telco, premised on an app-first experience, immense contractual flexibility, and pricing that in many respects seems too good to be true. But in a highly competitive market, this journey is just getting started for Kelvin and the Mellon Mobile team. Look, I, I think it, I see it as a privileged up, upbringing. I mean, it was, it was very low-key, but I grew up on a farm. Uh, nice, simple life, 
you know, it, it was, was, it wasn't complicated. <clears throat> um, but Zimbabwe was going through a couple of challenges at the time. So my family decided to move through to South Africa. So moved down when I was about 10. Um, my parents have always been farmers and or entrepreneurs. Sure. So I think there's an element that you, you get from that. Um, went to Pretoria Boys and then matriculated in, in 97. Okay. Um, and tell me, were, were you, were you an entrepreneurial kid? Were you the, uh, the kid who was going, man? Market days, lemonade stand, buy low, sell high. What, what you know? Those things we try maybe when we're a bit audacious. No, as it's, kids. it's quite interesting. Not at all. Um, but I was inquisitive, yeah. so uh, certainly love technology. I used to, you know, pull the the toaster apart and and not be able to put it back together. Uh, you know, various electronics, I did, gaming consoles and stuff like that. So mm. there was an interest in technology and, and those kind of things. But I think entrepreneurship uh, builds out of problems that you see on a daily basis that you just can't live with, all right? And if if you back yourself and there's a vision and you say, listen, I, like this is frustrating. Why do we have to operate in this realm? Uh, that's where I think true uh, entrepreneurship comes from. Mm. Now, there are lots of lessons that need to be learned, but it, it, unless it's a true problem and the problem's going to be big enough, I think that's where uh, – you know, there's a book by Yuri Levine, and it says, focus on the problem, not the solution. Mm. <clears throat> One of the things he says there is, true disruption only happens in industries that are big enough for mm. it. So yes, there can be a problem that irritates you, but if it's too small and there's not a big, big, big enough market for it, you, you know, you're not going to disrupt and you're actually not going to be able to build a decent business on mm. it. So I think it's it stems from a problem. And I think I've always had that inquisitive mindset and, you know, why do things have to operate in certain ways and uh, et cetera. So I think my journey has been a little bit different, um, but sure. it's, I think everyone has those core values. I mean, yes, there are those guys who do the market days, et cetera, yeah. and they're sort of born and bred and they, they love the sale, et cetera. Um, that, that wasn't me, but it, yeah. it was, uh, it, but being very inquisitive and certainly just wanting to fix things all the time. Mm. It, it's just, uh, yeah. That's it's, the, uh, you know, there's the, the misnomer that, uh, the the super charismatic out there take the stage founders are, are the ones that are winning. But ironically, most of the folks on our podcast that we invite are not because they aren't that, um, but they're building significant businesses are folks yeah. that are, you know, to your point, they stay the course, they see a problem, they just cannot live with this problem. Uh, you are disrupting in a particularly large industry at the moment. So we're going to yeah. come back to that in a few moments. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you schooled the Pretoria boys obviously great school still is. Yep. Were you an academic? Were you super strong? Were, you know, and, and in, in light of that, did you have your eyes set on a career? Was it doctor, lawyer, accountant, or was it, I'm, I'm just getting through this. I, look, I was a boarder. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, look, I was an academic, but it was all round. I mean, I think that's one thing about being a boarder in, in an in a all-boys school. You tend to, you, you do, you're forced to do the sports and, and, I, and I'm glad I had that rounding, right? So it's a, uh, it's a great balance between the academics, the sport, the the extramurals, et cetera. And be, being a boarder, you you need to fill that time. So you you tend to do a lot more than I, than I think you would do as a as a day boy. Um, but you know the journey in a, in a school like that. I mean, I, I at no stage said I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, et cetera. I I, I left and I did the, the a couple of computer courses because I absolutely did not know what I wanted to do. So I said instead of wasting money and, and, and going to to varsity, I was going to try and figure it out. So um, at the time, Microsoft was the the big thing, MCSE, MCSD, sure. MCSDBA, all those kind of things. So I did the those short courses and <clears throat> then landed in in a Y two K project, and that's kind of how my career in in IT technology sort of spun off and then you know, went into Accenture and did some consulting. But so it was um, accidental, put it that way. But yes. uh, was, this a, was this a positive Y2K project or was this a, oh my goodness, Y2K? Uh, look, it was a very successful Y2K Amazing. project. But I mean, look, the whole Y2K thing was, was, was uh, overhyped, sure. as, as we all know, but it was a great project. It was a, a medical aid. And, and I think that's one thing about being in the software development and, and or technology space. You, you end up being in lots of industries, learning so much about different different things. And, you know, it, it, it's what excited me. So, you know, mm. I'm bored pretty easily. <clears throat> so it, uh, it helps being able to sort of jump between industries and, 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 and solve problems in that way. Fair, fair. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, you mentioned uh, after that quick stint, and presumably even if it was amazing, it wasn't retirement, 
uh, retirement ready wealth, I'm sure, but yeah. uh, you join Accenture and yeah. obviously very different, right? Less uh, task and more consultative. Um, brilliant business and most folks will know that if they're listening in today. Um, I think there's always room for a stint mm. in the consulting biz, uh, totally. developing some frameworks mentally or otherwise. You do two years at the business, I'm sure work on many projects. And then I'm curious to know, you make your first jump into into founding something. Mm. This is 2005. Uh, you hadn't come from the telco space. So I know you mentioned some software background and those mm. sorts of things, been part of the medical aid space as well. Maybe tell me about what was the first interest in mm. in, in getting into telco? Because you, you end up founding it. But it may not have been called iConnect, was it? From that early on, so it was yeah. amazing. No rebrands, good job. Uh, but 2005, you found iConnect Telecoms. Maybe talk to me about that first transition from... Mm employed to entrepreneur and, and what was the opportunity you saw? So it was legislation change at the time. So uh, South Africa was deregulating. They were allowing voice over IP into the market was, was one of them and then started to allow uh, other forms of uh, internet connectivity. So in, internet at that stage was mostly dial up and you know small ISP and a couple of ISDN lines, etc. but <clears throat> not much from a, an internet perspective. And then certainly from a voice of IP perspective, you know, that was the wild west. Um, I remember, you know, we were tromboning calls and it's, it's so crazy, but you'd send calls. So for instance, you wanted to send a call back to Joburg. It, so to get it cheaper, you send it like via Afghanistan back into South Africa and you'd say 15 cents, right? I mean, that's how we started. Sure. So um, it was an interest, interesting industry, interesting time mm. because the interconnects weren't ready. The, the operators weren't ready. Telcom certainly wasn't a, a keen fan of, of what we were trying to do. But we stuck it out. And that, that was really the, the, the start of the disruption is, you know, Telcom was a monopoly and there must be an opportunity here. The legislation's changed. Let's jump into mm, this. And mm. that was a, a very steep learning curve because one, voice of IP in South Africa was non-existent. So you, you couldn't go and buy something off the shelf. Um, and even the, the bigger guys who kind of started a little bit ahead of us, of, of what we were doing, the product was terrible. You know, so we kind of, that's actually how it started is, is a couple of reseller agreements with, with a couple of the big guys. And you realize they were just doing it badly. We were like, well, geez, they're doing it badly. Let's try and do it better. Sure. Um, and I remember one story, I, <clears throat> I found a really smart uh, guy just come out of varsity and he was like, look, I can do this voice of IP thing. So we put a couple of asterisk boxes together and we started our, our voice of IP journey. But uh, we just, we, we're struggling to scale that solution. And uh, we, we got some open source software and spent, it was about seven days locked in a room until we could figure out the software from end to end. And I mean, it was, it's a great journey because at the end of that, we had a product that we could launch. We knew exactly how it worked and then we started selling it. So mm. like that was the, the, the maverick side of it. I mean, it was, I, I think that's, it's, it's part of any entrepreneurial journey. You've got to be endlessly optimistic. Like you cannot listen to anybody. I mean, if I had to listen to all the naysayers and also the craziness, I mean, like yeah. sending a call via Bangladesh, it was stupid. We kind of knew that, but hey, there was money in it and the call quality wasn't that bad. So hey, let's do it. Sure. So it's, yeah, it was a, it was a cool journey. And we, mm -hmm. we kind of went from voice or IP as the original thing into sort of hosted PABXs and then onto fiber connectivity, you know, so the, the, the business evolved in, into sort of, additional product sets and we end up some really nice customers you know it's like the plascons the mass mart you know so it turned into a a really nice business mm. um that was my first venture into uh ftth as well yeah. so you know we built a and really just, just nice fiber to, to oh there we go fiber to home. fiber to the home. cool so, so all, all still connectivity centric yeah yeah so staying okay. in, in, the, in the telco space so you know fiber to the home uh, which was the first consumer business i built because it, the, the i connect was traditionally uh, a b2b sure. so it's fiber to the business uh voice of ip to the business hosted pbx to the business you know all those kind of things and uh you know fiber to the home was this craze we, we managed to get a, a deal with vomitel as they started just after they launched and we built a really nice business out of that right. and I, at the end of that journey, I sold the fiber to the home business actually to sell C, okay. uh, sold that off. And then I, I exited the business. So sure. it was, it was a long journey, but I, it, it, it took many facets, but there's so many learnings in that, you know, mm. from mm. how to manage a business culture, managing shareholders, building 
technology, products, systems, uh, you know, MVPs and, and, and those kind of things. So, you know, how to sell, you know, all, all the very basic things. So I think yeah. it really set up that start of an entrepreneurial journey for me was, was the first one. And it, but it was great because, you know, I was able to, to get out, sell, sell, and then, you know, I, I, well, it was 2017 when I, when I, I, I exited there. I sure, sure. wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew yeah. I'd had enough in, in that business and, okay. and wanted a new challenge. Okay. It's, I mean, I think the one thing I don't want to skim over here, firstly, this, is, this ends up being 13 years of your life. So we spent a whopping six minutes on it. And, <laughs> and I think, I feel like that's a great disservice, right? To, sure. to all of those learnings and all those experiences, and I'm sure many highs and lows. Um, but you founded that company as a 20 something year old man in a largely incumbent driven hard to enter space uh goodness me yeah i mean i think uh, of course there's one thing to say if see the opportunity but building a company getting the right team on board raising some, presumably needing some cash yep. more than you would have had post extension days totally you know the, the and this was your first full-time venture maybe maybe talk to talk to our audience about what were probably some of the hardest things in the first venture and again this is 13 years mm. so it's almost like you probably grew up as the venture did. Um, yeah, I totally. What were some of the hardest things, perhaps? You've spoken about great these opportunities, and clearly this has ended in a in a good thing. But maybe over the thirteen, what were some of the hardest things you had to navigate, perhaps? I mean, I think the hardest thing is that you you it's there, there's no there, there, there's no manual for this. So you know, you're going in, you can see the opportunity, and let's go. So it's you know, I had a bit of money sure i could i could start this thing up and, and it, you know it was enough to build the basics but then you quickly to your point now you need funding um and that's an entire different journey mm. and, and we'll talk about that you know when it, we talk about sure. funding for sure. melon but yep. it, the lessons learned in terms of funding and it's once again it's lessons learned in what not to do because you kind of like you know friends and family who's going to give me some money and you, you kind of put that together and, and off you go mm. The the biggest lessons that I learned out of that journey was like it was true startup. Like it was, you know, garage, hardcore startup, like getting involved in the tech, hiring the first people, doing the first sale. So, you know, when they say like the, the founders or the startups, like you you every single thing in that company. Sure. And I think that was hard to to sort of understand. And then, you know, you hire your first employee and, you know, they're good and the next one isn't so good and now you've got to get rid of them and how do you get rid of them? So now you HR as well. And then you realize you want to scale. Now you need marketing. Well, what is marketing? You know, now I need to sell. Well, I'm not a salesperson. You know, those kind of, <laughs> uh, those things. But sure. you, you, you learn all of those skills and as long as you're willing to learn the skills. Um, and, I, and I think what comes out of that is learning your blind spots in a process like that is so important because you know, there's, I, I think any business in a single founder startup is exponentially harder mm -hmm. because you, one, you don't have a support structure. Two, you're really super self-aware in terms of, you know, what are my, my, my blind spots? What, you know, I, I think I can sell or I think I can do marketing or I think I'm good at product development. But actually, the guys out there who are excellent at those kind of things, and I think mm. it's that's a bit of a process and a, a learning that you 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 go through. Sure. Um, and then it's just the maturing of the business, right? So it's mm. it's taking it from a tiny little startup with you know you kind of doing everything and you're chucking things together, and you realize, well, listen, this isn't actually a real business, and there you know we're actually making real rev revenue and there's real money. Um, now it's it's from that true like messy startup stage into scale up. Sure. And I, I find that I found that extremely hard because that scale up side uh, well, side of it required money at that. Sure. So sure. up until then, it was tiny bits of money that you could, you know, it's, it's friends and family and you can kind of make it work. But uh, once you get to that point, then you need uh, investors and where that comes from PE, mm. VC mm. or whatever, high net with individual family offices. And but, this, this just contextually is well before we had even a semblance of a VC ecosystem at, or folks with private capital. 100%. So super um, hard. Super, super hard. Not necessarily as connected a world. No LinkedIn. Uh, no. You know, no no is, LinkedIn. Is, no way to. free and going into mix it days. And like just contextually, <laughs> even for consumers, it's like, how do you find these people? Exactly. Mm. And I think 
you know, lessons out of that. Look, it's a different world now, but then it was, you know, how do you find these people? You know, and I, coming from a farming background, my family were in it. So, you know, I, I was at dinner parties kind of pitching my idea on the side quietly, not, not really sure. sure. And uh, I met these two farmers who had uh, uh, recently were part of the, the, the land um, uh, land acquisition. So it was a government buying back land. Mm -hmm. So they'd had a fair amount of money. So I approached them and said, look, you know, would you guys like to get in technology? And uh, these two guys were like, sounds interesting. Sure. Let's look at it. And kind of went through a week weeks long due diligence process they said oh this looks cool we'll, we'll give you some money um so that that, that was cool i think the yeah. a lesson learned out of that is trying to take farmers <laughs> and put them into technology yes. is an exponentially harder thing to do right because they there's there's little to no understanding of what you're doing they're trying to put farming uh, thinking principles, and sure. principles sure. around it, you know, the amount of times I was told, but it's harvest time. And I'm like, no, it's growth time. You know, it's, so those kind of yes, yes. challenges that you've got. So was there a moment where you thought it's actually, it's not worth, not worth keeping going here? Oh, I mean, it's almost every day, right? Yeah, so not almost yeah. every, but, but often, sure. you know, because it's, you've got a clear vision. And I think that that's part of any startup journey is that, you know, the initial stages, I'll be honest, there was no vision. It was just like, I want to change this and it looks cool, et cetera. But, you know, once you're in it, you can actually see the, see the vision and you know exactly what you want to do. And you try and share that vision and you've got guys who are just not interested. They, mm. you know, it's kind of harvest time and let's just take money off the table. And you're like, but we are disrupting. We, and at that stage, we were ahead of the market. And my view was, let's just stay ahead of the market. So let, let's just keep growing. We can build it into, into substantial business if we keep doing what we're doing. And so you've just got a completely different cultural uh, mindset. Sure. And, you know, that's ultimately why I exited at the end because I, was, I wasn't having fun. Sure. And I think part of the startup journey is that when you stop having fun, you need to exit mm -hmm. because it, it, it is a hard journey. You need people to support you. And, you know, if your vision isn't being met, it's hard to get up and say, well, you know, it's not my vision anymore. I'm building something that's somebody else's vision. And you've got to then decide at that point, is it something you still want to carry on doing or is it time to exit? Mm. And for me, you know, I poured, as you say, 13 years of my life into it and it just felt right. You know, I'd, I'd done a lot. I'd, I loved what I'd done. I'd, I'd, I'd managed to sell, sell the base to the one side to sell C. So we yep. had, we had some capital in, in the company. So it just felt right to sort of say, guys, it's been an amazing journey. I love you, but I, I need to, sure. to to move on. Sure, um, sure. Yeah, I love that point about conviction because so much of it is just without that, without the vision, without the we're really building something here, and this is what I'm committing myself to. It's yeah. like, man, this is hard enough as is, right? It, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know the passion that comes with building a startup. You know, it's I often say say to people, you know, th there's a fine line between passion and you know. A craziness i guess but it's if you don't have that passion getting up in the morning and yeah. having to do the hard things because i mean there's a lot of stuff in startup that's just exponentially hard sure. right and if if the vision and the passion isn't there or it's quelled then you kind of start ask yourself questions like why am i doing this you know and i'm not a i'm not i'm not a person to sort of you know, sit in the background and mm -hmm. say, well, mm -hmm. I'll just go through the motions. I can't go through the motions. I, I kind of wish I had that, that trait to that make did, my life sure. so much easier. Yes. Um, but when I, when I feel that, you know, I'm just going through the motions and ticking boxes and, you know, do, the, then I realize I need to, to step back or step out. Fair, fair. I think speaking of stepping out, you, you've mentioned you sold some of the assets, some of the customer base yep. to, to sell. So you eventually exit the business in 2018, long journey, it would be fully understandable if you were just tired, to be honest, and wanted to take it's, it's five exactly. years off. And, and I don't know what financial position that puts you in, but you're in your late 30s, presumably have some money. Yep. Uh, now, were you married at the time? Uh, I, what, what was your, your home set up like? I was married at the okay, time. Cool. Just just recently married. Okay, sure. Yep. And so, I mean, it's understandable if you just wanted to you know, buy, a, buy a plot back on the place and, uh, and uh, call it quits for a decade if you wanted. Yeah. Right? So, I'm curious, what, what's your headspace like at the time? Were you thinking about cool next venture? Was it Look, some time off? I, I think what was interesting is I married, I was married and I had two kids. Okay. So my daughter was two, my son was five. 
So, you know, and I just felt at that stage, like as I say, I got to the point, the passion wasn't there sure. and I needed a, a, a new clean headspace. But no, there was no stage that I was going back to the farm, et cetera. Like I could feel that the journey wasn't done. Like I hadn't achieved my vision, right? I, I had a clean, clear vision of what I wanted to do and it wasn't going to happen inside that company. So, you know, I just said, look, let me take some time off, yep. clear my head and let's see what the, 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 the next venture is. So that's, and, and I think, you know, having kids it changes that, you know, when you, when you just, you know, you need to spend some time with them, but you know, and, you, and you've lost the passion. It's, it's hard to sort of reconcile those things. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a firm yeah. believer in, um, Work work life balance. I think yep. it comes as and when it is. I don't think it's a it's a binary, you know, work yes, life. Course, I don't think course. that that exists. Um, but when it's there's zero passion and you 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 you're messing up that work life balance, then it just doesn't reconcile for of me. Of course, of course, that's very fair. Um, so I think you know, and thanks for being candid about that. I think it's just always interesting to understand the mm. the headspace. We've got a lot of exited founders on the show, and it's, it's interesting. Everyone wants to be in that space and then you're in it and you're like, oh, now what? Or mm -hmm. like, what's next? Or actually there's immense pressure to, to deliver. Or It's a weird season, right? It's super um, weird, but, yeah. but I'm very, uh, very grateful you shared that. Um, now, of course, at the time you mentioned to me, vision's not fulfilled. You're eager to get your, your teeth into what's next. Uh, and then all of a sudden, MTN comes knocking. Yeah. Uh, maybe talk to me about, and just share with our audience, don't have to go into details, but what, what convinces someone who's clearly entrepreneurial, wants to solve big problems, you know, I get approached by arguably the biggest telco on the continent yep. and what happens? So it was an interesting one. I mean, I think, as I say, I was, I was in no, no rush to, to, to start the next thing. I wasn't sure what it was going to be. Sure. And it was probably six weeks more or less since I'd, I'd, I'd left iConnect and sort of looking as I wasn't even looking. And I was headhunted by, by MTN. Kind of got the profile and I was like, no, thanks. This is, this is not for me. Like, I mean, it sounds amazing, et cetera, but this is just not for me. Um, so I turned it down. <clears throat> Guy came back and said, you know, just have a look at it, mm. you know. Um, I was like, no, I don't think so. And uh, <clears throat> the, the, the MTN South Africa CEO at the time, Godfrey Matsu, actually gave me a call and said, just come for the interview. You know, myself and Rob Shooter, who was uh, a group CEO at the time, have a quick interview. We want to talk you through what, what our thinking is. Um, you know, I think you'll like the the opportunity. I was like, okay, cool. Like, what have we got to lose here? And I remember walking into Rob's office and uh, I had the initial interview. And they had done a couple of acquisitions and one in particular was a company called Smart Village. And... They put three different CEOs through there. It wasn't working. They couldn't monetize it, et cetera, et cetera. So they were like, look, we want you to fix this. We'll give you air cover. We'll carve it out. It's not going to be part of MTN. We'll give you the funding, hmm. build this thing, fix it, and then we'll decide what we do with it. And give us five years. So that's all we want. Don't to stay for longer, but come in, help us fix this. Sure. So I was like, well, that I can do because it's it's close to an entrepreneurial journey. You know, you, you carved out. I don't have all the bureaucracy, et cetera. So, so I eventually said yes. And that was a really cool journey because I will say building, and listen, it's fixing a startup. So it wasn't building. It's just fixing a, a startup inside MTN was was interesting and hard because never really been done before. Sure. So there were a lot of brand new lessons. Um, there was still a lot of corporate red tape that you had to go through, but it was quasi, so I had a lot of flexibility on the one side and then a lot of, you know, red tape and restrictions, yeah. et cetera, on, on that side. So that was really interesting, but we got to rebrand the business. So we built the first ever sub-brand of MT in South Africa, which was which was a lot of fun. And, you know, we took it from the worst ISP in 2018 to the number one ISP in 2019. So very cool journey, cool mm. story. Um, and, and for me, what, what I learned out of that lesson was the culture, right? The biggest thing when I walked into Smart Village was that culture was completely broken. Um, and you cannot build any company, never mind a startup, if the culture doesn't exist. You know, I've got a very strong view is that 
If you look after your staff, they will look after your customers. If you look after your customers, they'll pay their bills, which will then look after your shareholders, right? Whereas everyone focuses on shareholder, 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 you know, staff and customers are secondary tertiary. Whereas I, I believe it's completely the other way around. So look after your staff and you'll win. So that was the first thing that I did when I got mm, there was just yep. clean up the, the, the culture because it was absolutely toxic. Wow. Um, because of being an acquisition, it was kind of on the side, not really being managed. These poor guys were just lost. Um, there were contractors in there. There were you know, guys half being paid. It's, it's just, you know, it's mess. A, a mess, yeah. exactly. Yep. Um, I, <clears throat> so I really enjoyed that part of it. It was, but it was, you know, I had enough leeway and flexibility inside there that you could actually make a difference. So we, we, we really came from a, and, and Smart Village was a, a closed uh, loop uh, fiber network, sure. an ISP. Sure. And we went out and we got all the, the open access. So from Vumatel to, to OpenServe, Octatel, all, all the different networks, put that together. And, you know, we launched with, with a great offering, um, super simple sign up. I mean, I said to the board at the time, I'm going to make sure there's a three to five step sign up process. And everyone kind of looked at me like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Sure. And we got it right with five. Yes, yes. So Amazing. it's, you know, I, th I think that, but those are key learnings, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. take out the friction. Yeah. So sort the staff out, make sure that they, 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 they're, they're on the journey and they want to be part of the journey. And then, you know, make sure that the customers can mm. come in easily, mm. right? So, so don't go and put all the red tape in and make it super hard for the customers to come sure. in. So, sure. yeah, I think we did that extremely well. We trust you're enjoying today's episode, produced in partnership with Ingenie. We're now going to take a quick break and hear from Zoe Mayring before getting back to today's conversation. Hi, I am so happy to be here. My name is Zoe. I am the Marketing and Communications Associate at Ingini. And Ingini is Africa's first ethics specialized accelerator and think tank. And basically, our organization was founded on the belief that innovation and technology developed by Africa for Africa can help solve Africa's most pressing education issues. Ingenie's primary mission is to advance the quality, relevance and accessibility of education across the Sub-Saharan African region. And we are passionate about advancing education, improving educational outcomes through entrepreneurship, innovation and collaboration. We support founders, entrepreneurs and innovators who leverage technology to improve educational outcomes. And we do this through a three-pronged approach. The first prong is business acceleration. And what this means is we help our founders scale their businesses. And we do this in three ways. So we facilitate market access, and this means connecting them with the people they need to be connected to. So whether it be investors, government officials, we are the connectors. And then we have impact measurement. So how our team at Ingenie facilitates this with founders is to help refine and implement even design impact measurement systems. And basically this helps put founders in the best possible position to engage with stakeholders like investors. Lastly, we support our founders to become financially sustainable. And we do this through investment readiness support as well as access to funders. The second prong to this approach is research and advisory through the work of our Ingenie think tank. And what we do is we conduct localized research in the field of education and technology. Essentially, we want to be a resource hub or a research partner for stakeholders so that they can make the best possible decisions that are evidence driven. The last prong is ecosystem development. And how we do this is we convene a diverse group of stakeholders, making sure that all voices are in the room through events and workshops and panel discussions and networking opportunities. And this is just to ensure that collaboration and innovation thrives. Etec is often an overlooked sector within the realm of tech. 
Um, so we are delighted to partner up with Startup Club ZA to put our founders at the forefront and help amplify their mission to improve educational outcomes. First and foremost, we work on the ground with founders. So if you are an edtech startup who is working to improve your impact in the space of education, we urge you to work with us and to connect with us. We'd love to work with you. If you're someone who would like to partner with us, whether it be with our programs or for research opportunities, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us. If you'd love to learn more about the work that we do and the incredible founders that we support, please visit our website at ingini.africa. That's I-N-J-I-N-I dot Africa to learn more. We hope to connect with you soon. Um, thank you for having me. That was Zoe Maiden, Marketing Associate at Ingenie. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. I love that you share that because I know so much of those like, core value, core values are now like really embedded into the melon proposition about like, just yeah. seamless user experience and uh, your staff seem happy. <laughs> I need to chat to them more, but I'm sure they are. Um, I think you, you mentioned to me it was initially a five-year gig. Mm. Um, I don't know if you saw that out, and I'm curious to know, you know, you end up founding this, Metal has been founded on the back of mm. of that, and uh, maybe talk us through what was the opportunity that you saw, why why move on to this, this new thing when you mm. kind of have the backing of Big Brother already, if you would. Mm. Uh, where, where was your headspace at? You finished at MTN in 2020. 21 come 22 i'm sure you already had this idea digesting and mm. forming in your mind maybe talk to us about that transition as to how you've founded melon mobile yeah so i i think one of the the reasons that you know i could just see that things could be done better you know um and i was getting more and more frustrated so in the in initial stages i had a lot of freedom flexibility but you kind of got, go from the ready to stepchild in the corner to the shiny little thing that everyone wants, you know, wants wants, wants to to grab hold of and 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 etc. So suddenly it was a lot of scrutiny on the business. It was so the the agility mm. was completely lost. And back to the point, I started to lose the passion, etc. Because I'm like, well, I can't build anymore. We we it, like we just hit a, a ceiling, and. <clears throat> As soon as you hit the ceiling, now I've got to sit back and kind of go in, into this corporate machine, which I could have completely just, you know, done. Sure. And uh, <laughs> my wife certainly would have preferred me to <laughs> preferred, do that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I I stuck it out for as long as I could, and I just eventually said, you know, this is also this is just I'm not going to fulfill my passion and what I want to do. And but being inside MTN and and really, you know. I was privileged and, and I will say like MTN was a, it's an amazing company to work for. I was privileged to, you know, travel to a lot of the other, the other upcodes and sort of see what they were doing. Um, but what you realize is the opportunities within telco, you know, telco has not evolved in 30 years. Um, yet it is the enabler for what we do today, mm -hmm. right? Social mm -hmm. media, all those things. So it's the, it's the enabler, but they haven't evolved. So, you know, sitting there, I just thought, geez, this is a huge opportunity. And once again, legislation was changing at the time to say the m and need to be more MVNO friendly. Mm. And just if you can quickly clarify for the audience, m, &M o versus MVNO, what, so, what, what so is it? So mobile network there? operator, so the, sure. the primary telco, so MTN yep. Vodacom, et cetera, MVNO, mobile virtual network operator. So and there are many forms of that, but yep. I mean, in short, you're running off the back of, of the network towers, but you're operating, you know, the customer interfaces, uh, et cetera, on, sure. on that side. Sure. Um, okay. So, yeah, I could see that. Um, the challenge, though, was that MVNOs in South Africa had not done particularly well. You know, yes, there's no yes. sort of outstanding MVNO example to say, geez, you know, that's the, the, the gold status or, or what you I should think focus the, the on. the most coined one is probably Virgin Mobile, right? One totally. of the early adopters, ran off of Celsius infrastructure, and 15 years later just still hadn't quite hit it and closed exactly. down. So, yeah, so yeah that's, uh, that, thanks for that context. Just wanted to... Yeah, an important context, yep. right? So, I mean, you know, a couple of banks had MVNOs, there are retailers at MVNOs, but none of them were really, you know, shooting the lights out, sure. if, if that's the, the the right wording. So, but I looked at it and I was like, let me dissect why is this? I mean, you know, is there an opportunity here or am I just sort of dreaming? Sure. 
And when you dissect it, you know, the the challenge is that guys were taking the m and op- so the mobile network uh, sort of propositions, pricing, sign-up j- journeys, and just giving it a, a, a different brand. I was like, well, that, that's not a way to disrupt, and you're certainly not going to win in that space. I mean, the, the big mobile networks are massive. They Absolutely. really know what they're doing. Sure. So you're not going to disrupt that space. You've got to do something completely different. So, <clears throat> and in that ves- investigation, you started to see what, what we refer to as DNOs or digital network operators. So it's an MVNO, but completely digital. So I looked at that internationally and I was like, wow, th- th- this makes a hell of a lot of sense. Like there- there's a lot of uh, scale and opportunity in this. And <clears throat> I-, I went to MT and I said, look, guys, it's been an amazing journey, but I'd like to still sort of stay part of the family, if you want to call it that. Let, let's sign an agreement, but I'm going to go and do this. I was very upfront in, in terms of what sure. I was going to do. Sure. And because look, ultimately we're still using the network, right? So it, for me, I've always seen as a, as a, as a symbiotic relationship, but uh, you know, people ask me, do we, do we compete against MTNs? Absolutely not. I mean, it'd be ar- arrogant to even think that, you know, we're, we're, we're tiny in comparison, but sure. yes, we do. We do use the infrastructure. Brand wise. Yes. Yeah. Uh, totally. And that's where it got interesting, right? So, so, so yes, I left, and now I had this, this this grand plan. I think this, and this is an important part for me, is that when I left MTN, I had this super, super clear vision of what it needed to look like. What are the elements that needed to be be injected? Um, what are the non-negotiables? Uh, customer journey, brand. You know, I was very clear. Yes. Um. And I think that for me is like, if you're going to like book, so for me, clear vision is number one. You have to have that. Number two is team. So can you build a team that can buy into that vision because it's going to be hard. So if the team don't buy into the vision, you're going to have churn and you just can't afford that in the early stages. Mm. So super clear vision in terms of that, knew what kind of team I wanted and then it was down to, you know, how do we actually do this? How do yeah. we build a digital talk? So I've got to be honest, I was a little bit naive on that one, yes. thinking that uh, <laughs> sure. I could go and, you know, and onto the shelves of uh, Incredible Connection or whatever and, you know, pick up some software and off we go. Of course. The reality was completely nothing like that. So yeah, sure. most of the digital network operators at the time were spin-offs of the primary networks. So those stacks were built in-house and... Um, and or you had very disparate stacks, so you'd need to put you know by ten to fifteen to twenty different systems, kind of glue them together, and then you could build a digital yeah, which is which is crazy. And I was right. like, look, that's definitely not going to work because mm-hmm. the whole whole purpose behind a digital telco is to try and have a single interface, a single view of a customer, and then remove all the friction. So it there were parts of it. I was like, geez, this is going to be. I, I don't think this is even possible. Yes, you know, yes. but. You know, you have to be endlessly optimistic, so so it didn't stop. Yep. And um, I'm curious, and I'm going to interject <clears throat> there momentarily. Um, you, you, I think you, you have this macro idea of what this needs to look like. Solid vision. You know, you need a team to implement. May even as you've investigated, understand. Okay, cool. The nuances of what the product stack needs to look like. It all needs money, right? It all needs money. And uh, even though you had sold the company and worked for MTN and I mean, that's not telco disruptive money. Presumably, no. you need to raise some capital. Yeah. And and what was that? What was that journey like? And what was? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know. A lot of founders, of course, are don't necessarily have the context of experience like you have in an industry. And so, of course, that's a massive credibility play when you're sitting in front of a potential totally. investor. But maybe just talk to us about your journey, and, mm. and I'm sure that's going to be some useful so, wisdom. So I'll jump into that next. I think okay. what I did was I wanted to make sure you know. So the learnings from the iConnect and the funders and sure. et cetera was I wanted to make sure that I had a product, that it wasn't slideware, you know, because as much as I had this clear vision and I could sell it and, and you know, I could, I could get across, I wanted something that you could at least touch and feel because from a negotiation perspective, it's a stronger a stronger Absolutely. position of, of negotiation, right? So in the background, it was, it was making sure that I had a platform because I didn't want to go and get, so I wanted to have, make sure I had all the pieces, before I went to go. So Fair. I had enough money that I could survive um, <clears throat> after the two ventures in MTN, so, so that was fine. I had a signed agreement with MTN, so that, you know, if you just take the building blocks, if you sure. want to actually go to to 
to, to, to look for money. Yep. I, I wanted to make sure I had that stuff in place. I had a license so I could do this. I didn't have a platform. So that was the next big, I had to solve this platform, platform challenge. Sure, sure. And I met a company uh, who, you know, they said, no, we've got this amazing software. I said, okay, cool, do the presentation. The presentation was spot on exactly what I wanted. I was like, wow. So I showed them what I wanted. Our visions matched. And I was like, this is brilliant. So sort of two, three weeks into the journey, I realized I said, they so were selling slideware. Oh, there we go. So they had this vision. So look, they're, they're the world's biggest telco provider. So that gave them some credibility. Sure. But they absolutely had none of what they were selling. Yeah. Sure. So I called them on it. And geez, I had all the executives from around the world saying, look, how do we make this work? Because we need a first customer. We love what your vision is. How are we going to make this thing work? So I said, all right, cool. We can work together. But at least now we work honestly going forward because yeah. now we know where we stand. Yep. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into. You know, this could end badly, but at least I'm, I'm aware of the, yeah. the, 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 the state of the nation. So uh, I then had the platform. I had the license. I had the, the mobile agreements. Um, and then I built the team. So I'd... And, and some of those team I was, I was already paying, right. helping people presentations, et cetera. The other I'd sort of parked in the background. Core, said, core team, who, who are those people you bring on almost immediately? Who's the key? So it was it was guys that could just help me with, you know, the everything. admin side of the business. And okay. it was, you know, it's it, listen, every single person I, I started with, the people I'd worked with before. So people I knew that were going to go with me for the long journey, that I'd sold the vision to, and... You know, as I say, there were guys who were hanging in the balance. Like, for instance, the guys who built the brand. Mm. You know, I went to them and said, listen, I want you to do this on risk. But the second I get funding, I want to bring you in. This is, And we kind of negotiated on that sure, basis. Sure. So uh, to that, the CTIO was exactly the same thing. I said, look, hang in the wings. This is what I'm building. He said, listen, I love your vision. What, love what you want to do. Amazing. Let, let, let's do that. So then the funding journey started. <laughs> sure. And and but at this point had you had you called it Melon Mobile was that absolutely okay. so so yes so so let me, let me jump back to Please, that just very quickly I'd uh, I'd gone to the, the my my creative team that was sort of consulting for in the background and I said guys we need a name so I think at that and, and we were having these uh, meetings there were what six of us as a sort of a founder team plus myself um so to CTIO uh, the two creatives um and then sort of my, my customer operations and then to, you know, PR and, and, and at the time I'm my ex uh, assistant. Sure. And then we were the founding team and we said, we need a name, right? So, so the kind of game is list of names and it's like Blitz Mobile and this mobile. I was like, guys, none of these are working for me. <laughs> sure. And, and sure. primarily because the vision I had in my head was I wanted to create a narrative around the brand. Mm. I don't want the name to create the narrative. Sure. So I said, go back to, to, to like, the drawing board. Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting with my wife, sort of having a brine and a glass of wine one day. We're coming up with names. And, you know, she's like, what about Melimo? So I said, we need to come up with names that have no meaning. Yes. Like, no meaning whatsoever. Yes, yes, yes. Which ironically are, are the names people end up attaching the most <laughs> meaning to, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Yes. And uh, kind of, we stumbled across lots of names. We ended up with Melon Mobile, kind of like the alliteration. Yep. So I sent it off the team and I said, try this. And, their very first iteration is the brand that you see today. Love that. So very cool. it just, you know, it was meant to be, and, and that's how we built the brand. So Amazing. off the back of that, we now had a brand. So we built a, a, a little presentation. So actually a video that mimicked the entire vision and journey. So the, the sign up journey, the, the top ups, the ad, so like the entire app was built as a, as a little video. And yeah, I look back at that video, yes. how close we actually got Amazing. to that video. Very it was pretty cool. cool. Yeah, very cool. Very, um, very cool. And as I say, at that point, it was just vision. Then built a, an investor deck, and then went out onto the road. Um, and it's the first time I've ever really done the scale of funding. And to mm. your point, mm. you cannot um, uh, disrupt the telco industry, which is a 200 billion rand market with, you know, one or two million rand. This is not going to, you know, you need proper funding. So... Went out there. I will say this is the, without a doubt, the hardest part of this entire journey mm. because the interesting nuances around it. So, I mean, I went to over 70 different funders and it was from family offices to VCs to private equity to um, high net worth individuals. Yeah. 
And the interesting part for me, and, and I think the frustrating part, but it's, it's, it's unfortunately just part of how the industry works, is I think I had one no out of 70. Yeah. But I got like 65 ghosts. Yes, yes. As completely ghosted. And I mean, yeah. every single one, I'd come home and I'd say, That's these it. guys are the way. <laughs> yeah. you know? yes. They're amazing. They loved it. Yes, and then yes. you phone and you email, and there's just nothing. And, and that was 100% consistent. Um, and, you know, when I went, once I'd actually got the funding, I went back to a couple of the guys. I really just wanted to understand like, what the story was. And they were like, listen, we love the product, but we weren't going to be the first. So we didn't want to say no because mm. it would preclude us from going to the next round. So by just not answering you, it allows us into the Keep next round. Hook kind of thing. It's just a terrible, so frustrating. It's, a, it's a terrible way to do and it. I hear that mind. from almost every founder we speak to. Yeah. Uh, so very consistent. I, I found that super frustrating. Mm. Um, but then I, and, and this, I found a high net worth individual. Sure. But the story behind that, and I, and I think the, the reason I'll share in more detail is, yeah, please. you know, don't give up on this stuff because mm. you'll eventually come right, you know. So it was an introduction by, I'll be honest, someone that I don't have a lot of time and respect for, kind of did the, the introduction. And I was like, all right, fine. Like, I'll go, you know. Yes. Like, at this stage, yes. I was like, make it 71 or 72. Yeah, sure, like, so what? Sure. Let, let's do it. And um, we set up the meeting. And kind of half an hour, he was, he, he was in Camps Bay. I, I, was, I was in the Cape as well. Half an hour from his house, I get a WhatsApp. Sorry, I can't make it today. I was like, whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, got, it's fine. Of course, I saw and, this coming. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's fine. It's, it's, it's happening again. It's sure. a cool turn around, go back, carry on with the, the, the other initiatives. Uh, he reached out again sort of a month, five, six weeks later. You know, I'd love to meet. Let's have a chat. Sure. Same story, 30 minutes. Ah, sorry, I can't make it. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm tired of this guy. <laughs> sure. And uh, sure. <clears throat> also sort of a month later, reached out again. Love to meet, but I'll come to you this time. I was like, okay, that, that's great. Mm. So 10 minutes before I get this WhatsApp, I'm like, oh, now what? And uh, he, he said, can I land on the soccer fields? Next to next, so it's in an estate. Of course. So he, he's a he's a helicopter pilot. Yeah, of course. Um, so he landed on the soccer fields. It was a five hour meeting, and the rest is history. So Amazing. he was the he was the initial funder. Incredible. Um. So you know those kind of stories are important, mm. and those kind of journeys are important. So you only see the news articles, right? Exactly. And so and so raised this, and it was a very linear journey. But I love the candor you've shared there. Thank you for doing so. Yeah. Just to know, man, the ten, like. And we shared it a lot of our with a lot of our founders at our events. Is often this process is just don't die, mm. right? It's this idea that you keep just keep alive until the damn breaks, kind of thing. You know? You'll and that's find on the someone. fundraising yeah. side, the product side. It's totally yeah. But but the point is, if you don't have that vision, right? Yeah, sure. And then the team. I will say, like having that team around me, like they keep you balanced, and you know that the team's excited, so yeah. you don't want to let the team down. But the, like if I didn't have a clear vision. It, one, when you're presenting, and I think it shows that you don't have a clear vision and sure. you don't have that passion. So if you can balance that, those two elements, you, you will eventually win. Mm, um, mm. And I think that's the, those are the key, great, great the wisdom, key things. Great wisdom. Now tell me, you, you're armed with, in principle, the right ingredients here, mm. right? You start putting this recipe together, Meta Mobile launches in 2023 to the market. Since then, it's obviously gone from consumers to SMEs. You're doing some very interesting stuff with AI. It's, it's a maturing proposition. Yeah. Um, talk to me about launch day. How, how are things received? Uh, did customers just, were they pushing down the door to get in on, on melon contracts? What, what's it been like? And obviously, it's, it's been a super busy year, year <laughs> yeah. and a half since then. What's it been like? I, I think, look, we, we had high hopes for, for exactly that. Um, some key learnings out of that was, you know, we had a great uptake. I mean, our, our first two weeks were were, were exponential. Sure. But once the hype had died down, it's those customers are staying with us. But you know, we were just weren't getting the, you know, this, this the hockey amazing stick. hockey yeah. stick that we all expected. Sure. And it was trying to unpack that. You know, is it proposition? Is it price? Is it product? Is it customer journey? Like, what is it? Because in our minds, we'd got all of that right. Mm. And it's, it's another part of the learning, right? It's overnight successes never happen. I mean, maybe they do, but it, it's rare. It's rare. Um, and it's a, it's a process. And, you know, one of the, the, the 
products that we built was build your own plan. Mm. Are we like, I mean, internationally, this was, this was brand Common. new and, 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 and interesting. So, you know, the ability to choose how much data you want, how much minutes you want, how many texts you want, you know, customers can build their own stuff. What we found is that customers had no idea what they need yeah. <laughs> because they, they'd never had any of this visibility sure. or flexibility sure. before. So you're forced into 500 minutes, 500 SMS and five gigs, right? So that's your, that's your baseline. Mm. So now mm. you're telling me how much do I want. Well, I don't know. Yes, exactly. So that was actually a huge friction. And point. how much can I afford? I'm, I'm also not entirely sure sometimes, oh, right? Exactly. Yeah. How much you yeah. spend? I mean, that was an interesting question. We started, how, many, how much do you spend? I don't know. It just comes mm. on a bank account. Mm. You know, so that was an interesting insight that, you know, you've built this novel idea. It, it is an important thing. And we started to see uptake now of that product because people are, are, are using it. But Amazing. to start with, we had to say, okay, when well, yeah, will you go back? We had to actually put propositions together, which is completely what we didn't want. It. Yes. So we had to put like we had traveler products and social media products, et cetera. But then we started to see the uptake, you know, sort of increase. It's a bit again. of blend of both. So it's the market can kind of, kind of acclimatize, I guess, to this totally. flexibility they never knew they needed. Right? E exactly. Yeah. And visibility that sure. they didn't even know they needed. I remember my wife before we met uh, first, my wife coming home to me, have you seen this, this business melon mo? Like, she could not get her mind around the flexibility okay. in the best respects because she was like, this is too good to be true. There's got to be. And then there's almost this apprehension to be the first mover amongst your circle, right, to, to get on board because you, you just want someone else to have tested it. And is there something? It just seemed almost too good to be true. And, that's, were, and that's the important next point, right? Yeah. So we had a trust deficit. Sure. We disrupted too much. Um, and also there were lots of guys before us We'd made promises to this market, right? We're going to come in, we're going to have the best customer service, we're going to have the best network, we're going to have propositions that work, all of these kind of things. And I was like, you know, we've heard this before, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, are these guys going to be around next week, next month? You know, what if I port? But the porting journey is terrible. So, you know, not our porting journey, but porting in general. Sure, so like, sure. I want to keep my number and can I trust? So <clears throat> what we learned in the, the initial stages was, one, we had to fix our propositions uh, on that side. Then we had this massive trust deficit. So how do we bridge that trust deficit with the customers to say, we are legitimate, the product is real, we are here to stay, we do have the best network, we have got the best customer service, we are the most flexible, we have the most visible product. And that's a lot to yeah, tell it's customers. A lot to digest, and it's just yeah. telling you. Yep, yep. And I'm like, great, thanks for telling me, but I still don't trust you. Yes, right? exactly, so exactly. It was... So we had to take a massive step back and say, all right, cool. We now understand the problems. Mm. How do we go and bridge the, those things? So that was, that was the challenge that we, we had put to ourselves and the team. And, and since we've, we've done that, um, you know, I think we've, that's why we're winning today is because we went tight, we went back to basics, go and understand the, okay, well now geez, we actually got 10 problems. Yeah. We thought we had one or two, we actually got 10. So how do we fix each of those? Um, yeah, and as we that. fixed all of those, you know, customer ups grew. Um, you know, we got a full five star Halapita rating. I mean, it's unheard of in, mm. in any industry, never mind in telco. I mean, telco's got the worst. So, mm. and that's where people go to complain. They go to complain, <laughs> not necessarily to praise. No. So, so you know, we've got like a four point eight on on the Google Store, amazing. four point eight on on Apple Store. So you know, our customer service is sorted. So that was that was building the trust. Sure. Those sure. kind of things. And it, and what's interesting to me as well is just. Competitor brands entering super crowded spaces. And I know that, you know, the last month you guys have launched this uh, out of home campaign, mm. billboard campaign, a little bit cheeky, but very, very cool. And uh, I know it's even been received well. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, Melin has literally plastered their own campaigns over other campaigns, which uh, is, I'm pretty sure it's completely legal. I think it's legal. <laughs> I, I believe it is. Um, but just so clever and in a market. It, uh, of course, that'll be compared to the likes of the pineapple campaigns recently. Okay. With that said, though, we've had the pineapple founders on the show here today. Mm. Also, super disruptive proposition in a highly competitive incumbent space totally. where often you just can't compete on budget and brand spend marketing-wise. How no do you chance. massive trust deficit? And ironically, since they launched their billboard campaign, have also started to see ridiculous exponential yeah. growth. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, maybe there's something there around if we want to break into the incumbent spaces, like this, it's counterintuitive that as a tech first, app first product, we'd want to spend a lot of money on outdoor advertising. And yet that's often where the trust building That's comes, where the trust building right? happens, right? So, so it's a combination of, so, you know, I, and I think 
once again, you've got to trust the journey. Sure. You know, if yep. we had launched billboards on day one, wouldn't have had Probably the same lost. effect. Exactly. So, you know, we needed to go through the through the journey, understand all the different learnings, failures, etc., that we had post launch. Sure. So that when we did this campaign, um, it would have the uptake, and then also the tech would work, and we'd have the you know the 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 ability and the and the just the growth trajectory that we wanted. Amazing. Um, you know, in terms of the, the campaign, you know, so once again, pineapple is a great example. Yep. You know, the insurers are very boring, very state, the traditional ones. Telco is exactly the same. You know, they've lost that edge and, and it become very, you know, customer mm. unfriendly. Mm. So, you know, when I went to the, the marketing guys, we need a campaign that's going to cut through the clutter. You know, the big guys have got a billion rand marketing budget. You're not going to cut through the clutter by putting up a few billboards that say, go to Melon, right? So I put out the channel and said, guys, how do we take a campaign that is super disruptive, gets everyone talking and just, you know, changes the, the entire narrative, but get everyone talking about Melon Mobile and what we're doing? Um, <clears throat> so I did two jobs. So we launched the 14-day free trial. And the reason for that was to also, th we were trying to, to fix the trust deficit. Sure. So versus us telling you, we have the best network, mm. we have the, the most customer options, we give you the most visibility, all of these things, it's a go and test, sure. test us, right? So Very instead smart. of us telling you, you go and, go and test it out. So very unique in the space. No one had really done it, but we backed ourselves, we backed the product, we backed the brand, so put out the 14-day free trial. So we launched that six weeks prior to the, the out of home campaign. And that was purely just a test that we'd got the product right and, and the, the, you know, the, just the customer journey right. And then, you know, the guys pitched five or six options to me in terms of out of home. And I was like, no, no, yes. no, yes. no. Yes. And then they pushed this one on the tail. And I was like, guys, this is an absolute hit. Like this, I can see the talkability, the, the disruption. It, it, it's, this is melon. And this is the brand that we want to be. This is the brand we want to be known as. You know, we want to create a talking point. We wanted it to be cheeky. And that is the, the brand tonality sure. that we have. Sure. So. Love that. The, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's been very well received. Amazing. You Amazing. know, it's. Uh, and the brands that we, we worked with or took over have just been. You know, I think just in terms of that, you know, we, we chose brands that are proudly South African, have a sense of humor. You wouldn't take this thing too seriously. Yeah, of course. And. You know, see the upside because both brands have been talked about mm. now, right? So as much as we got exposure, they got exposure. Exactly. exactly. Um, and there was a lot of fun around it and banter. So it was a great campaign. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and long may it continue. Absolutely. Uh, of course, right? Um, it's 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 honestly such a shame we have so little time because we could probably pick your brain here on a number of things, uh, both in this and past journeys. Uh, three questions I want to ask you before mm. we close out today. The one is around just one thing that you see founders doing so wrong and you cannot understand why they're doing it so wrong, but just something you would like to maybe, if you, you've got an audience of, of founders, different stages, different sectors here, what's one thing that you maybe get asked a heck of a lot of or an observation you've made in the space that, that could be valuable for this audience uh, in, in their startup journey? My, my biggest thing is people going into industries they don't understand, right? So, as I was saying, you know, you, you might see a problem out there and that's absolutely fine. I mean, sure. I see a hundred problems out there. I don't go and try and fix them all because, you know, restaurants, one of my pet peeves, just the whole customer service thing, but I'm not a restauranteur and I'm never going to try and fix that problem. Right. Because I just don't understand the intricacies of that. So I think if you're going to transition from, you know, be corporate or a job into an industry, make sure you understand the industry and the inner workings of it. And I mean, the inner, inner workings of it. Because you don't want to be tripped up by, oh, wow, there is actually a solution like this. Or there's re regulations mm. or, or those kind of things. So a lot of guys are just going into things that I completely have no idea of, you know. But my best friend made money off that. Yeah, but that's because he had skills there, right? Sure. So sure. it's, I think you just be careful of, of, of doing it for the sake of it. And then number two is make sure the industry is big enough. Um, you know, it's... That's so key because mm -hmm. if the industry is too small, it doesn't matter how big the problem is, you're just not going to be able to make money off it. Great, and you're going to need such a big market share. You know, in, in, in telco, it's a 200 billion rand market share. I need half a percent to build a billion rand business. That's, that's, that's attainable. Exactly. Right? Can I get half a percent? Uh, yes, I think we can. Amazing. So. Great wisdom. And th thanks for sharing that. I think you, you're talking about getting to that half, half a percent. 
maybe quickly tell us what is what is the next 12 months perfect world you've got the long-term vision what is the a shorter term version of that look like what, what next 12 months 18 months what can folks expect to see out of the Merlin stable i think look we're going to keep doing what we're doing Great. um i keep telling everyone everything we do has been deliberate so you know it's when we built the propositions that were deliberate you know the customer journey was deliberate um i well, devices is the next big thing right i keep telling everyone that and it's you know we need the device to enable the sim card mm -hmm. i mean and you know south africans are it's, it's a billion rand a week industry the the handset uh, industry in south africa so it's absolutely massive but we're going to come out with innovative ways to get a device all right it's not going to be the traditional way i'm not going to give too much away here but look uh, out don't. for it yeah i mean i'm excited because i know offline that's something i've said to you like we're in yeah if i can get a you device know, couple right? it with some hardware exactly, exactly. Yeah. so you know our you know, Morris, who's uh, XMT and, and, and my chief commercial officer, you know, one of the things he keeps saying is that if someone comes to us wanting a device, they must walk away with a device. Now, what that means is we've got to figure that out, right? Sure. So some guys might not be credit worthy, but there's ways to still, you know, be it on a three month basis, yep. they can get finance. You know, some guys are super credit worthy. Great, we'll give them 24, or whatever else. So we're just trying to say, take the space. We know devices are important, but how do we do it mm in a different way to the current 24 month contract. Yeah, and that. that's what you've got, you know? Um, I think a lot of my frustration is, you know, you come in wanting say that the iPhone 15 is 25,000 Rand, you just declined, but you actually, you can't get the 19,000 Rand mm. device, but no one mm. tells you that just yes. decline for the 25, yes, right? Exactly. So Classic. that's kind of the thinking is to say, well, you, know, you might want that, but you, would you like this? And well, I know you want it on 24, but what about 12? Mm. You know, just trying to, to, to change the way th things are done. So we're going to be very deliberate about entering the space. But when we do, we want to make sure that it's a differentiated offering that matches Mellon's sort of thinking, ethos, culture, et cetera. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a copy and copy and paste of the cool work you're doing already, right? And just applying it to this other vertical. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about that. Let me tell you. And, uh, and of course, uh, we'll be following the Melon journey super closely. It's very exciting. Um, Calvin, I think the last question we ask every founder on the show here, yeah. you know, at some point you and I are going to be older men and you'll be sitting on a stoop, whether it's a plaza or otherwise, and <laughs> yeah. thinking, okay, cool, or, or this, this either went super well or, or it's, it was learning. Um, what, what, is, what does success look like for you as, as Calvin Collett? What does it look like? You know, is it a desert island? Is it... Is it just more wealth than you can spend? Is it generational? What, if I had to ask you that question, what is what does success out of all of this look like for you? Look, I, I've never been driven by money, right? So, and, and I think I've got to be honest that I, I think any entrepreneur who's driven by money will struggle because money is a it's a long tail before you get it money. runs out. It's part of exactly. I think money is a net result of the journey. Mm. It's not why you do this. I, I think you know my vision has never been to be you know this multi-billionaire sitting on an island. It, if that happens, happens. It's fantastic. I'm certainly not going to say no, but that's not the reason I did this. You know, I have a passion for the industry. I, I want to see it disrupted. So to answer your question in short, if we can go out there and we've made a change to this industry and, you know, I'm not scared of competition. You know, if one or two others, you know, pop up and they do doing some disruption as well, and the market ends mm. up in a better space because of what we've done, for me, that's success. Beautiful. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in having a, a greater reason for doing something that's other than money. Of course. No, I love that. And I think just to the points you've made around culture and vision and building here for the longer term and the actual what true disruption is, it's making an impact in the broader market. Uh, you seem to have the right ingredients and awesome. uh, we'll certainly be be following the journey and evangelizing the journey um, very, very closely. Thanks, man. Uh, thank you it. so much for your time today. I'm, I'm pretty confident our listeners are better for it. And uh, we're very excited to see what, what comes next for me. Thanks. Mobile. I appreciate it. It's been, it's been a great chat. Amazing. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Calvin Collett, founder and CEO of Melon Mobile. You can see more uh, about them, of course, coming out soon. Thanks for listening to today's episode. That was Calvin Collett, founder and CEO of Melon Mobile. I'm Matthew Marsden, and if you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, follow us on our socials, and share this with your network. We'll see you next time.